Hi, everyone, and welcome to our ASO conversation series. I'm your host, Tom Moore, the Director of Marketing for the Akron Symphony. Our special guest today is Erica Snowden Rodriguez, our principal cello player. Erica has been with the orchestra since 2012. Welcome, Erica. Hi. How are you doing today? Pretty good. Pretty good. Right. Staying healthy. <laughs> That's good. So as the philosopher Plato said, the beginning is the most important part of the work. So let's begin with how you got started in music. Sure, yeah. Um, well, I kind of come from a musical family, actually. Um, my father uh, it was a French horn player, actually, and he played in the Buffalo Philharmonic. Um, and so, you know, my older sister played violin. Um, I picked up the violin at first. And, um, you know, it, it ended up not really being my thing. Uh, I couldn't figure out how to hold it. And I remember um, just really being a, kind of uh, intimidated by my teacher. I had a very strict violin teacher at first, and it didn't take me too long to realize that the violin wasn't my, my jam. So I ended up switching to the cello probably about a couple min months of, of playing the violin. Um, and that's how I got started. Just at a pretty young age, I was probably about uh, seven when I started. So what is it about the cello that you really enjoy? <laughs> I didn't have to hold it up. <laughs> 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 that was such a big challenge for me at the, at the start. So uh, yeah, I mean, that, that just practicality wise. Um, but no, I, I really just love the cello for the sound. Um, you know, it just has a much more mellow, uh, tone and i think it's a uh, as a beginner a little bit more pleasant on the ears <laughs> at least for me so um is there anything speaking thinking about your you know the cello that you currently have now is there anything unique about it does it have an interesting little backstory or can um, invent so my my instrument you know i mean it, it's nothing too too crazy or, or special of course it's extremely special to me. Um, I've actually had that instrument since high school, since the end of high school. So um, I've, I've really stuck with that instrument. Um, it kind of has an interesting story. It's a, it's a French made cello and um, it was made around the turn of the 20th century. So over a hundred years ago or so. And um, the cello actually was found in France in an estate sale. So it, it had been sitting in a closet somewhere untouched for, you know, 30 years or maybe more than that. And so uh, there's a company in Toronto, uh, which actually, uh, you know, seeks out these estate sales that have instruments and they find these instruments and they, you know, refurbish them. And so this cello that I got, um, it had just been taken out of this closet, kind of given a whole makeover, a new setup and uh, was put for sale. This is probably, early, you know, early 2000s or so when I got the instrument. And um, amazing thing is that it has changed the tone of the instrument has really opened up over the time that I've played it. And they say that, you know, a lot of times if an instrument is unplayed and untouched for such a long time, it starts to kind of close in the sound you know, kind of gets a little bit more muted. So over time, um, you know, I fell in love with the cello the first time I played it, but since I've had it, um, it's has really opened up in the sound. And, you know, I always have people saying, oh, your cello, you know, it sounds, you know, incredible. And, and I'm like, well, it, it is incredible, but, you know, it, 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 I got a good deal on it. That's for sure. So. <laughs> Oh, that's interesting. See, that's, that's one of those things that as a non-musician, I don't, uh, I wouldn't really think about, but I guess that does kind of make sense, especially if it's made out, it is made out of wood, correct? Yes. <clears throat> so I could see, you know, if the wood compresses or if the wood expands a little bit, how that could impact the sound you're getting from it. Mm -hmm. So you talked about how you started with the violin, you weren't comfortable, you moved on to the cello. So this comes to the one question that I always find interesting. Do you think the musician chooses their instrument or do you think somehow the instrument chooses the musician? <laughs> oh man, I mean, I think it's a little bit of both. Um, you know, I, I, I was drawn to the strings, um, you know, started with the violin, didn't work for me. But that's a that's a really good question. I I, I actually um, I play a couple other instruments as well. So I mean, cello is obviously the the main the main one. Um, but you know, I I actually took it upon myself to to start learning trombone a few years ago, 
Uh, and so I don't know where that fits into your question. But, uh, uh -oh. Steve Ostro is starting to get a little worried here. You're going to move in on his turf. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I'm not sure. Um, you know, it, the, I've also, you know, been playing a lot of drums since the pandemic, you know, I've been home and um, my partner um, has a has a drum set in the basement. So I, I kind of was like, you know, I'm gonna mess around with some drums for a little bit. I've always wanted to play the drums actually. Um, and so, you know, I've, I've kind of, you know, picked up a new hobby in the last six or seven months, however long it's been. And I know, I remember um, you did, um a few months ago, you did an ASO, ASO at home video for us where you were playing a Venezuelan guitar, if I'm remembering correctly. So yeah. you picked up, you've picked that up too. Yeah, that, uh, that instrument's called the cuatro. Yes. A four string kind of, kind of, you know, like a small, almost like a ukulele, it's slightly bigger. Um, but yeah, I, so I actually also play guitar pretty seriously uh in high school so i picked up a guitar in high school the regular just guitar um kind of taught myself and really got into it um you know also was writing songs at a time and doing a lot of improv and those sort of things and uh, my mom who's from venezuela um she was also self-taught cuatro player um, which is a, you know, like I said, the, a very traditional Venezuelan instrument. And so, you know, growing up, we had a couple around the house and I kind of pick it up a little bit here and there and mess around with it. Um, but I really became interested in, in learning the cuatro mm, probably like a, just a couple years ago, pretty recently. Um, and so I started to, you know, I mean, do what everybody else does, look up on YouTube, <laughs> um, how, to, how to learn a new skill. And um, so, you know, from, from there, I've just kind of been playing for fun and, you know, kind of learning some folk suit tunes and um, brushing up on my own Spanish a little bit, which is good. I don't have the opportunity to practice it as much as I'd like to because, you know, my my family speaks at home. But uh, yeah, it's 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 nice to, to be able to, to play an instrument that, you know, I feel I, I have ties to culturally as well, you know. Nice. And for anyone who may is, maybe has not seen the video, if you go to the symphony's youtube channel and just look at our aso at home playlist you'll be able to see it on there it's real. it was one of the ones that was really it was done really really well it was a lot of fun um you know watching that one when you when you sent it over so uh for those who might not really be kind of familiar when we talk about you being the principal for this your section what does that really mean in terms of like what did what do you do what um you know what does that really you know we use those terms a lot you know in the business but for the person out maybe outside the business what does that really mean when we say someone is a principal player um so yeah my my role as as principal cello i guess is to lead the section um and you know just kind of provide a little extra guidance um as to how our part is supposed to be played um, I typically get to play any solos if there are any written in the music. Um, and I also am kind of, uh, somewhat in charge of deciding some bowings, um, you know, which direction the bow goes and, uh, just kind of how to execute some of those things. Um, I think, uh, the biggest part of my job actually is, is being a team player and really trying to get everybody on the same page. You know, the, there's, um, I think there's nine uh cellists in the symphony and you know nine incredible very talented individuals um and so you know i kind of take it upon myself to kind of be like a, a little bit of a team captain you know i really try to build a relationship amongst everybody and um just yeah just get us to really play together and we have a wonderful cello section and i'm very um you know lucky to be their their leader so to speak um, but yeah, it's a, I really, I really enjoy it because I, I always, I, I, I'm somebody that likes to bring people together. So I feel like, you know, it's kind of a, a, a good place for me to be. Um, I'm happy to play in the section, but I really feel like I shine um, in that role. Okay. That's really good. So you know, you've talked a little bit about, um, you know, we were talking about how you kind of moved into to music. You talked about how your dad was a professional player. You've talked a little bit about your mom with, you know, your cultural background. So how has what other ways has your personal life influenced your musical career well um 
I mean, being kind of a, a somebody who generally passes as as white and American um, is, is kind of interesting, you know, because, uh, you know, people generally they see my name, um, which my my official legal name is Erica Snowden, you know, I added in the Rodriguez because I always felt like, hey, I feel like my mom, <laughs> my mom's side is just as important, you know, um, and, you know, so uh one of the one of the things that i really feel you know kind of right now in this very moment is kind of dictating where i want to go as an artist is kind of exploring that that part of myself that uh you know that is is venezuelan and trying to learn some more about the venezuelan music and you know i told you i've kind of been getting into cuatro playing a little bit more um and i've also kind of realized too that uh, you know, I love classical music very much, but I really love a lot of other kinds of music. And um, I, I did mention earlier that I um, was into writing my own songs and things. So these are just kind of some things that I've really been thinking about now uh, as an artist, you know, expressing who I am and expressing who I am fully, um, you know, when in the past I maybe haven't. And so that's something that I'm, that I'm really trying to come out and, and be uh, proud of. And um, yeah. Okay. You know, um, everybody in the orchestra had, you know, reached that point where they said, you know what, I think I can make a career out of this. When did you kind of first start to think, you know, when did that light bulb sort of go on for you? That's like, Hey, I can make music be my career. Um, it was pretty early on. I, I would say, I guess I didn't really, you know, think of it as a career almost at first. It was just something that I knew was my passion that I knew I had to do and I had to pursue. And I figured that out in, in high school. And, um, you know, I wasn't so sure that I wanted it to be orchestra right away. You know, it kind of took me a while to, to kind of find that, you know, this is, this is the place that I want to be at, you know? And, and I think so many musicians trying, trying to make it, you know, they, they kind of have this idea that, um, you know, you have to make it into a full-time orchestra to really be there, you know, and that was something that, you know, just didn't fit right for me. And, um, I was fortunate enough to figure that out before I took a million auditions. <laughs> um, you know, so I feel like I've kind of found this, this, this sweet spot for myself where, you know, I play in the Akron Symphony. I also play um, principal in um, the Erie Philharmonic. I have this kind of flexibility and fluidity with my schedule, which I love because I don't like to be doing the same thing all the time. Um, you know, but yeah, the, the, the moment when I really knew I needed to play music um, for my life was was in high school. Actually, I was on um, a tour with my with my high school orchestra, and we were watching. We went to see the um, Boston Symphony play. We were in Boston, and they played uh, Brahms Second Symphony. And I think that was maybe the. It wasn't the first time I heard the symphony, but it was the first time I I saw it performed live. And I just remember, oh my gosh, the the last movement just you know sometimes you just, music will just hit you, you know, and you remember those moments. And I really remember that moment being like, this is it. This is what I want to do. Yeah. There's really um, nothing like live music. And, you know, I kind of knew that before I started this role, but now that I've been, you know, with the orchestra for a few years now and just being there at the performances, it's, I, it kind of brings me back. And I think part of it too, is I don't know, 2020 seems to be the year where I think there's been a lot of nostalgia for a lot of people. And I just kind of think back to all the live concerts I was able to see. And just like you said, being able to see something live is just so different than, oh yeah, I can listen to that on, you know, I'm old enough that I still have LPs, um, you know, I have vinyl or, you know, I listen to it on a CD or I listen to it, you know, just through the earbuds on your phone, but there's just something so different about that. And then, so I know exactly what you're saying where, you know, it, just, it kind of hits you in yeah. a certain way. And it's really nice that um, something that you're passionate about, you can actually turn that into, you know, your career. That, that's, that's really huge. So you've talked about, um, you know, you're a member of, the, of our orchestra. You're also a member of Erie Phil. 
you're, um, you're also a member of the Sphinx organization, which is a national group dedicated to transforming lives through the power of diversity in the arts. Can you talk a little bit about how you came to be part of Sphinx and what your role is with them? Sure. Um, so, you know, the kind of the flagship um, event of the Sphinx organization is the Sphinx competition, um, which is a national competition open to uh, Latinx and uh, African American stream players. So um, I first learned about the Sphinx organization in college, actually, my, um, my former teacher, Stephen Gaber, um, had another student who was African American who participated in the competition and he suggested that I audition and send a tape in as well. So um, I sent a tape in in 2008 and was invited to the competition to perform and to compete. And uh, wow, since then it's, it's really been a journey. Um, you know, everybody who has kind of gone through the competition or performed with Sphinx in some way uh, is kind of considered part of La Familia. And it really is a, a very unique competition in that you really do feel that kind of sense of camaraderie, that coming together of, um, of those people. Um, so it's a really special organization that has really been an incredible influence on my life. Um, and so, yeah, I first got involved in the competition. And then from there, um, I've performed in the Sphinx Symphony Orchestra, which is the symphony that uh, accompanies the, the competitors. Um, I've also played in the um, in Sphinx Virtuosi, which is a uh, chamber conductorless chamber string orchestra, uh, comprised of uh, winners of the com competition and alumni of the competition, and uh, we we do a tour of the country uh, each year. Unfortunately, this year we we couldn't do it this this fall. Um, but there's still we're still doing some virtual activities actually, which is kind of nice. Um, but yeah, that's that's an organization uh, that has given me many opportunities to travel, to make music, um, great music with incredible musicians, and also to um, learn about a lot of composers that um, I wouldn't have. You know, a big part of uh, Sphinx Virtuosi is uh, programming works um, by composers of color, composers who are female. Composers who are generally underrepresented in the in the in classical music, so that's been a really amazing outlet for me to kind of learn and to embrace that that side of the music and, and to share that with with audiences who I think are really thirsty for new things, you know. And not of it, not all of it is new actually. It's just been, uh, you know, not performed or, or programmed. So, when you uh, perform with Sphinx, is there an educational component to it? Or is it just, is it just more of a, just, it's like going to a, I'm going to a, you know, and a concert, I'm going to a performance. Yeah. Um, so yes, we, we do both actually. Um, so in each city we have a, you know, a concert, which is your more traditional, you know, performance. Um, although we do speak about the pieces, um, before we perform them. And then we also, you know, partner up in with, with different partners in the community that we're playing in. And um, we do a lot of school visits and community engagement um, and educational programs. And a lot of the, um, you know, schools and programs and communities that we touch are, are, you know, mostly black and brown communities and communities that, you know, historically haven't had access um, to, to classical music. So sometimes, you know, we'll, we'll be the, will come in as a string quartet. Usually our, our group splits up into smaller uh, chamber groups so we can reach more people in that area. So that might be the first time, um, you know, these kids have seen a violin or a cello in, in, in person, you know. Um, so it's a really cool, cool thing to kind of, you know, give back to the community and, um, and to share what we love and to show that, you know, you can be who you can come from wherever and you can still pursue this and you you know it doesn't matter where where you're from or who you are this music is available to you as well so that's really kind of the message i think that we try to share with everybody yeah i like that a lot and the more I, you know the more i become familiar with the organization i really like um you know it, it sounds like they're doing a really you know some really good work and some very obviously some very important work oh yeah absolutely so actually, um, that's a good uh, kind of a good transition here. When you talked about um, music that's a little more accessible, you know, we're now a few months into our interlude season, 
for for the 2021 season and you were able to perform with amy amy cave at an interlude season event i think that was in september was that that long? that seems like so long ago already yeah, yeah. Know, everything in 2020 seems like so long ago yeah. so um the two of you were able to perform at the saint v uh flower garden and i remember that um so how how'd that how'd that day go how was it getting being part of the the interlude season Oh, it was great. I mean, um, my close friend, um, Alyssa D'Amico actually is kind of one the person who's running the flower garden and uh, that the flower garden you pick Tuesdays over the, you know, last six months or whatever has been like a really enjoyable part of my week. Um, me and uh, my partner, Samantha, we, we go out and we cut flowers and enjoy that. And um, you know, it's definitely been a nice way to safely get out a little bit during the pandemic. And um, so I kind of, once our interlude season got going, I kind of just had a little, you know, light bulb going off in my head that, hey, we should really try to try to see if we can do an event here because it's a big wide open space. And, you know, it's a, the, not many people were aware that the flower garden was there. It's kind of a newer thing. So I thought, you know, this would be great great opportunity to get some more folks out out there and also you know enjoy some music and and some nice weather which we had amazing weather that day thankfully but it was great it went really well we had a great turnout um there was uh some donations uh were, were being collected for two uh community farm farming organizations um and we were able to raise some money for that cause those causes and, and yeah it was a really fun time so I think one of the um, one of the nice parts of our interlude season, and this kind of ties into a little bit of what we've been talking about, is it allows the musicians a little bit more freedom to select the music you're going to perform while you're at the event. On that day, did you kind of pull out anything special? Yeah, actually, we did um, a, a couple things. I mean, we, we we wanted to do a really a nice mix of music. So and, and we really we spanned for about 400 years of music almost <laughs> there you know, we we did some baroque uh, music we uh actually played a new not a new work an old work but new to me um by a composer um isabella leonarda who was a baroque era composer female composer um extremely pro prolific composer and um she wrote this great it was like a i think it's a, a violin sonata actually so amy played the violence, you know, part, and I just kind of did the continue of the baseline part. Um, so that was kind of a, a cool discovery, uh, a new composer that that I hadn't heard of before this. Um, another work that that I was excited to feature was um, a piece by a friend and colleague from the Sphinx organization, Jessie Montgomery. Um, she wrote a duo for violin and cello. Um, actually, she wrote it for herself and a friend of hers. And um, so I, I called her up a few weeks out before the performance and I said, hey, you know, we, we really want to play this piece. It's a great piece. I had a chance to play it before. And um, she was like, oh, yeah, by all means, go ahead, perform it. I don't even know if the work itself is published or anything like that, but I got my hands on the music. <laughs> and, uh, and it's a really cool piece. And she's definitely a composer that, um, that all listeners should, should definitely check out. She's doing some really great work. Yeah, and I think uh, you know that's a good little uh, reminder to everyone when you see one of our interlude season events coming up. If you can get there, get there because you never know. You might hear something you've never heard before, and you're going to walk away really impressed by it. <laughs> so, kind of going on that, kind of continuing on a little bit of that theme of underrepresented, um, you know, composers. Last season, we started includes including more music as part of our Sandy Side Her project. Um, yeah, that was received very well by our audience. Unfortunately, the we weren't able to complete the season, so we didn't have the opportunity to feature Florence Price, Joan Tower, and um, I believe there was one other one that might have been there that's escaping me. But um, you've been a big proponent of expanding the music that we offer to our, you know, to our audience. Can you kind of talk a little bit about that, or kind of share your, you know, your thoughts and your philosophies on on why that's important? Yeah, sure. I mean, you know. The biggest thing for me is there's a lot of great music out there that's just not being performed. And it's, you know, it's not, it's not that it's not great music. It's just that, you know, unfortunately it has been pushed to the side 
or, you know, these composers, they haven't been taken as seriously, you know, for whatever reason, oftentimes because their identity falls outside of what is, you know, considered the, the norm, you know. So um, that's something that's, that's definitely important to me um, as, as a person who's, you know, Latinx and also as a person who's a member of the LGBTQ community because, you know, I feel like so many of these histories kind of fail to accept a whole person, you know, for who they are. And, um, you know, for whatever reason, their, their music just kind of falls by the wayside. And, you know, I, I feel like we have to make a really conscious effort right now um, if we want this art form to be continual and to be relevant. We have to, you know, find ways to play the music that's out there that hasn't been played. And so, yeah, that, that's something that, that's definitely important to me now. And I, I'm realizing that there's a lot of kind of unlearning that actually has to occur, um, you know, as we start this, because there's this kind of idea that, you know, <laughs> these composers aren't out there, you know, but it's really not true. It's just, we have to make an effort to, to raise those voices. And so, you know, I, I'm very excited with, with the, programming that has, you know, kind of started to, you know, you know, take a direction here in Akron. Um, because, you know, we, we, we owe that to these composers, we owe that to these, um, to our audience members too, you know, this music that, that is incredible music that, um, you know, it's just not considered at the same caliber, but it, it's, it is, you know, it's just a matter of, we're very, comfortable with our Beethoven and our Brahms and our, and our Bach. And I think it, it's, it's a shame that so many others um, kind of just are cast in their shadows. Um, so that's something that I, that I especially, you know, um, just trying to, to, to uncover stories too about composers who, who were gay. You know, I just, I just learned about um, a compo an American composer, uh, Diamond, I'm forgetting his first name. But um, he was an openly gay composer, um, openly gay in the 40s. And, you know, a great composer, but you never heard of him, you know? And there's so many others like that. And, you know, I, I think about, you know, all the times I, I learned about, uh, you know, Tchaikovsky or Barber and, and you know, the, the, part, the part of their identity, the, their queerness, their, you know, their closetedness, it, it's, it's just erased, you know, it's not talked about, you know? So that's something I'm really interested in uncovering those stories and uncovering composers and, you know, not just in the past, but today, you know, there's, there's incredible music being written today by all sorts of people. So I'm just kind of on a quest, I guess, just trying to find that and, and to, you know, bring that into our, into our concert halls and, and yeah, have, have that music heard and those people seen. Right. And, you know, that's um, on the same kind of on the same vein, you know, just this past year, as I had, to, you know, as Chris laid out the, you know, the season and, you know, some of these composers that aren't, um, you know, that aren't top of mind as I had to go back and research them and learn about their lives and read about them. It does become really interesting. And then I still remember there was one com one comment made um, last year when we did the um, the Shakespeare concert um, that included um, Ethel Smith's The Wreckers. And we talked, I talked to some people in the lobby after the concert and there were, there was a couple and they said, you know, if we weren't, if we didn't already have tickets, if we weren't subscribers, we probably would not have come to this concert because we weren't familiar with the music, but we're glad we did because we enjoyed it so much. And I think as an organization, kind of, you know, what we've been talking about is if you present something and it all fits into the bigger picture of what's going on in, the, in that, in the overall performance, I think it's really good. And I got, I kind of, um, always think of it kind of like what you see on Spotify or Netflix, you know, if you like this, you'll like this. And, you know, just as someone who is not familiar with a lot of that music, if I know I'd like something and somebody recommends something that's very similar, I'm going to give it a listen. And it's, then it's like, well, it's like, oh, yeah, I really did like that. And I think that's a good way to, you know, open up doors and just expose people, you know, to something different because, you know, they're going to like it. They may not realize it at the start, but when it's over, they're going to be like, yeah, that was really good. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, just they just need the opportunity to to hear it, right? So, and especially when our orchestra plays it, and then, then they know they're going to have a really good performance. <laughs> 
so do you have any favorite, do you have a favorite composer or any kind of favorite composers that really, you know, when you see, you know, the, the concert uh, schedule come out, be like, oh yeah, I cannot wait for that performance. Oh man. I mean, it's hard to say, uh, you know, I, I've always been a, you know, a, a big Beethoven fan, not gonna lie. <laughs> for me that that's, you know, I, I, you know, of course love his, his chamber music, um, his quartets, especially. Um, but, you know, I also really love just playing new music and it's a different kind of challenge, you know, uh, occasionally we get to do a premiere here and there. And for me, you know, just doing new work is really exciting. So, um, you know, yeah, I would just have to say it's like any piece I'm working on is, is kind of my, my favorite piece at that moment. You know, I mean, it's something I can really, you know, dig into and, um, you know, especially if it's new, not nothing against any of the, the greats that we play often, but that's what I'm really excited about generally is, is new works and new music. So are there any, do you have any memorable performances or moments that kind of stand out during your, your time here with the orchestra? Oh yeah. Um, a lot of, I mean, a lot of great memories, um, in Akron, playing in Akron. Um, probably one of the most memorable is, uh, was the first time I played the gospel meet symphony concert, actually. That was like totally revolutionary. I think for me, it was mm -hmm. probably one of the funnest concerts I'd ever played in on my, you know, formal concert black. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, you know, that's just one of those, you know, again, one of those moments that you just like really clearly remember, you know, I really remember my first, my first uh, gospel meet symphony concert mm -hmm. and just the, I don't know, just the vibrancy and the energy um, brought by the chorus and, and also the, the band, you know, there's really nothing like it. It's a very, very special concert that happens here in Akron. And I was really thrilled to, to be part of it and, and to, to discover the legacy that has been there for so long. Because I mean, my first Gospel Meets concert or Gospel Meets Symphony was probably, I don't know, like the, maybe the 20th anniversary. Was probably yeah. close to it. Right. So, mm -hmm. you know, it had been going on for a long time and, um, you know, it's it it kind of unbeknownst to, to me um, to sit down at the first rehearsal and be like, oh, this is how it's going to be. OK, <laughs> let's go. You know, that is that's that is always such a fun night. It's like you said, there's just so much energy and it's just so it's just it's fun and just. Part of, I think, um, why part of why I enjoyed so much is I know all the work that goes into it, you know, from the orchestra members, from the chorus, everybody just comes together and it's so much goes into that. And just to be able to see all that energy on the stage and see everybody in the audience enjoying it so much is really, you know, that really makes it all worthwhile. Absolutely, absolutely. And I also really enjoy the, um, the kind of communal dinner that happens um, before the before the concert with the with the chorus and the in the um, orchestra. I, I've had a time to a great time to meet everybody and to talk to the members of the chorus and I've made some good friends from from that as well. So outside of, um, you know, obviously preparing and then rehearsing the week of performance, is there anything else you do to prepare for a concert? Do you have any rituals, any kind of like special, I have a go to meal I have to have the day of a concert or, you know, what, how do you how do you prepare yourself? Um, well, you know, one, once you've been, you know, doing the thing for a while, um, you know, you, you, you kind of, it, it becomes a little bit more normal, you know, it's just like, oh, you're going to work <laughs> essentially. Um, so I, you know, I, I don't really have any like special rituals, I guess. Um, of course I, yeah, I gotta get a good dinner. I mean, that's no brainer, you know? Um, but no, other than, other than that, I mean, just, I guess like if it's like a, you know, a performance where say I, you know, have a big solo or something like that, um, feels like the pressure is a little bit higher than, than normally. Um, 
then I really do try to kind of center myself and meditate before, you know, um, I already am into meditation. So it's just five minute thing sometimes just to kind of, you know, make sure that the, you know, nerves are, are, uh, you know, under control, but you know, it's like you, you kind of just learn how to work with your, with your nerves. And I, I used to have really bad stage fright actually, which was definitely a process to, to kind of get over. But, um, now it's, um, yeah, it's just kind of like you show up and you, you know, that you're prepared. And that's a big thing. It's like, you have to be prepared. So all of the work, you know, has already happened before the concert, you know, so at the time of the concert, you just kind of relax and, and enjoy it. I really try to enjoy it and not get in my head about it too much. I like that. So um, what, what would we find on your playlist if we, uh, if we were to take a peek? What kind of music are we into? I listen to all kinds of music. Um, I mean, I listen to some uh, Simon Diaz, a, a, Venezuela, a very traditional Venezuelan songwriter, singer. Um, you know, I, I love salsa music. I love Selena, you know, Gloria Stefan, you know, all, the, all those things I kind of grew up, you know, hearing. I'm a big fan of that. Um, I mean, a big fan of hip hop. I, I mean, I really, I really like everything. I'm not a huge country fan, <laughs> one thing, but generally, you know, I, I, I love music and, and, um, yeah, I like yeah. rock. My, my partner is a, is a big rock and roller. So we have a, a lot of rock going on and a, a lot of records too. So don't worry. You're not going to with a lot of vinyl. Oh, I should have had her, I should have had her on the, uh, <laughs> to talk. So yeah, it's, um, yeah, it it's um I lost my train of thought there, so we'll we'll move, we'll move on there. So, so what um any hobbies or interests outside of music? I know you kind of talked a little bit about how you like to meditate and what um, anything else that you like to do. Yeah, um, I love to cook. Anybody that knows me knows that I throw down in the kitchen pretty seriously. <laughs> ah, see now, okay, that, that, so I've I've talked to Chris Albanese, our chorus director. He's big into cooking. Terry Orcott is big into baking, and we've been kicking around the idea of having cooking segments with different orchestra members where they actually come on and cook their go-to meal over Zoom, you know, have people buy the ingredients, cook along. So I don't know. We're starting to get a theme going here. Hey, that's a, that's not a bad idea. What's your specialty? Well, I, man, I, it, it's, I have a broad range. Um, but I'd say if I were, you know, invited to, to do this, you know, cook at home with an Akron Symphony member, I probably would make arepas, which is a Venezuelan, um, di well, it's really, it's a bread, it's a kind of a bread, but you kind of cut open the bread and you put a bunch of, you know, meat and cheese and, you know, avocado and things. So I would probably make something like that because it's something different and um, it's very easy to make and it's very good and it's cheap to make, which, hey, bonus points, right? So um, that's probably what I would do. I would probably like grill up a steak or something, get a fancy steak rub on there and uh, make the arepas and maybe make uh, some, you know, guacamole or something like that to go on there. And yeah, that would, that would be my jam. All right. See, now I'm really hungry. I got I have to start eating lunch before I do these afternoon uh, <laughs> conversations is how I'm getting all distracted by all this, by all this food talk. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So before our time comes to an end here, anything else? Have we said it all? Is there anything left to say? What would anything else you want to cover that we didn't get to? Um, no, I don't think so. I think that pretty much, pretty much covers it. <laughs> There's nothing left to say, <laughs> which is good. So that's good. Um, so, all right. Well, uh, so that is all we have for today. Great job. Thank you so much for your time today, Erica. Thank, Thank you. you to everyone for watching. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I stepped on your, uh, I stepped on your line there. <laughs> I just said, thank you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thank you to everyone for watching. We appreciate any likes, shares you can send out to help us grow our network. Let your friends know to watch. Check out our YouTube page. A lot of good content on there. And we will be back soon with another edition of the ASO Conversation Series. Until then, stay safe, everyone. <laughs>